contrast that then to this simple view of what an eco-museum is, a very fluffy, cloud-like concept which I've got here. The most important thing is that you've got a boundary, you've got a territory, you've got a defined geographical area. And you'll see in a moment that this might be something like an enormous landscape, okay? Or it might be something the size of this room, okay? So the largest eco-museum that I know of is in Alberta, in Canada. It's called Kalina Country Eco-Museum, and it covers something like 10,000 square miles of Alberta, okay? I say the smallest one, which I'll show you in a moment, is about the size of this room. So the idea really of the eco-museum is that within this place, and you know, when I wrote my eco-museums book, I called it a sense of place because I think that's what eco-museums are about. They're trying to capture the distinctive nature of particular places. Okay? So within the here you've got you know, the landscape, and that depends on a particular kind of geology it will, and um, the way that people have used the land, how they've modified the land over centuries. You've got the people who live there. You've got these things which we have identified as heritage. In other words, things that we think are important and that we value now, which might be archaeological sites. It might be vernacular architecture. We've got... Um, people who live there and their collective memories. And of course, in terms of intangible cultural heritage, we've got all the traditions and dialects and ways of life that people um, have within this territory. And that might be things, it's, and it's interesting, I think, about how you, how you define the boundary. Because you know, we get used, I think, you know, as you know, when we look at maps, we think of boundaries as being drawn, if you like, in geographical terms. So they may be defined by rivers or political boundaries or something like that. But in eco-museums terms, they can be defined by things like a dialect or a musical tradition or a particular form of dress. Okay? So um, how we define the, the boundary is actually quite interesting as well. Um, Sky mentioned yesterday my, what I called my necklace model of the eco-museum, which I really described uh, initially the eco-museum as, as being a thread, something that, if you like, holds together all these features of a place. And I m remember sort of drawing this model and you know, I had the Eco Museum as a thread and all these little different sites or um, features of place as the pearl on the necklace. And I, was, I really, I thought this was a really good idea. And I showed it to my wife and she said, that's rubbish. <laughs> I said, what, what do you mean it's rubbish? She said, well, what's actually holding it together? There's something missing. And of course, yeah, I'm not a necklace wearer. So I'd forgotten about the clasp, okay? The thing that actually holds the necklace together. And what the clasp is, of course, is local people. It's the people who are making the eco-museum work. So it's members of the local community, if you like, those activists that are actually making the eco-museum work. The people who've decided in the first instance that there are things about their environment that they value, and they want to see conserved and validated and cherished and interpreted for themselves, but maybe also to visitors from outside. So just to summarize then about what eco-museums are, for me they're about place, so they're not confined to a museum building. And most importantly in terms of you know, this workshop, they incorporate and celebrate intangible cultural heritage. Um, the people involved, and you know, they should, of course, be started and run and managed by the local community. Um, people are able to select from within their place those aspects of heritage that they value and feel are important. And I think they are, you know, quite, you can see, I think, I hope anyway, 
That is that they're a very radical departure from our, if you like, authorized discourse on, about museums. They are a form of alternative museology. Um, and certainly for me, they're one of the ways in which, um, or if you like, one of the, the most, the best demonstrations of, of that original new museology. Um, they've been putting new museology into practice. So to bring this down really to very basic things, then three basic pillars of what eco-museums are about. Firstly, they are about sense and spirit of place. What they're trying to do is capture what is special about the place where people live. Okay? And if this is done by local people, it should actually reflect um, what people themselves value. You know, this is what we feel about our place. This is what we think is important to us. And the word holism was mentioned yesterday, a holistic approach to heritage resources in their environments. So looking at how things work together, how nature and culture work together, this holistic view. Um, and in their environments means in situ conservation, preservation. So we're not moving something from their context. Again, we had decontextualization written up here. We're actually leaving things in context. So things are conserved and interpreted in the environment, and they're not moved into a special building called a museum. Community involvement. Unless the community invo are involved in a major way, unless it's a democratic approach, in my view, it isn't an eco-museum. So this is one of the real problems I have with eco-museums in China. Community involvement means a bottom-up approach. It's done by a local community. I think the issue for me is that in China, it's very, very top-down. It's very, very government-led. It's led by authority. And that isn't the way an eco-museum should work. It should be very much coming from local people. And also that it's malleable. In other words, you can pick from a whole range of different ideas, that different principles that eco-museums work to, and it is responsive to unique contexts. So anybody can use it. You can take it and you can use it um, to valorize a, an old industrial site or an archaeological site or to um, venerate uh, and appreciate a whole range of intangible um, cultural heritages. And I'll show you one place in particular where um, that is done, I think, very well.